Welcome to the Anatomy Laboratory for Students. Today's presentation is how to dissect the infratemporal fossa. My name is Carlos Andres Suarez Quian and I'll be your narrator. The famous newspaper commentator, George Will, once wrote, the future has a way of arriving unannounced. Well, here's another case where Mr. Will is incorrect. We know precisely when the future arrived because it gives us a sign. Our hair lets us know. We generally start to turn gray in the area of the temples, the location of the temporal bone, and the reason we call this bone the temporal bone. We will dissect this area in this video and the area immediately inferior to it, the infratemporal fossa. Important arteries and nerves are found here that transmit one of our most important senses, taste. Let's start the dissection of the infratemporal fossa. The infratemporal fossa is a space that is below the temporal bone and deep to the ramus of the mandible. Many port nerves and vessels traverse this space. Before starting the dissection of the infratemporal fossa, let's review the structures we previously identified when we performed the superficial dissection of the face. Here, we see the largest salivary gland, the parotid gland, and its duct, the parotid duct. One of the muscles of facial expression is evident, the sagomaticus major. We can also identify the masseter muscle, a major muscle of mastication. We start the dissection by cutting the parotid duct and reflecting it medially. At this point, we start the laborious process of removing the parotid gland using scissor technique. But we have to be precise because we're looking for delicate nerves that run through the parotid gland. The reflected parotid duct is clearly evident as indicated in the dissection. After carefully removing the parotid gland, the facial nerve and some of its branches become evident. In a perfect dissection, we would find five to six terminal branches. In addition, we can see the continuation of one of the terminal branches of the external carotid artery, the superficial temporal artery and its corresponding vein. We're now ready to enter the infratemporal fossa. For orientation purposes, structures we saw previously are now labeled. They include the masseter muscle and superficial temporal artery. Now, we identify the sagomatic arch to which the masseter muscle is attached. Using a probe, we insert deep to the sagomatic arch as far anteriorly as the arch allows. Then, using a bone saw, we cut through the sagomatic arch down to the probe. In fact, the probe is protecting the deeper structures from being damaged by the saw. We repeat the same action posteriorly on the arch. We again place a probe deep to the arch and again use a bone saw to cut through the arch. We can now use the forceps to reflect the masseter muscle inferiorly without much difficulty. Other structures now become visible. With the masseter reflected, here's the ramus of the mandible and the coronoid process of the mandible, covered by the attachment of the temporalis muscle, which has now been cleared to better demonstrate its location, and the condylar process of the mandible, the part of the mandible that articulates to the condylar fossa to form the temporal mandibular joint. We're now almost ready to enter the infratemporal fossa
but first we have to remove some bones from the mandible as follows. On the left side is an image of the lateral view of the isolated left mandible, whereas on the right is the left mandible as viewed from its medial side. Let's label the parts of the mandible we mentioned earlier that are apparent when we look at the lateral side of the mandible. Here's the ramus of the mandible leading to the coronoid process. The temporalis muscle inserts into the coronoid process, thus enabling its action of closing the mouth. And the condylar process. The mandibular condyle articulates at the condylar fossa of the temporal bone and is encased in the temporal mandibular joint. When you chew and sometimes feel your jaw popping, this is the joint that is popping. Also, it is possible to dislocate your jaw by yawning, but please do not try this now. It is painful. Looking at the medial side of the mandible, we see that there is a foramen, the mandibular foramen. To enter the infratemporal fossa, we will need to remove the coronoid and the condylar processes. But in addition, we will need to cut through the ramus of the mandible while keeping above the mandibular foramen so as not to injure the structures that enter there. Let's do this now. As before, we use a probe and push it deep to the coronoid process. Next, using a bone saw, we cut the process. We then place a probe deep to the condylar process and again use a bone saw to cut through the process. Finally, while using a probe, we insert it deep to the ramus of the mandible as a guide and cut off the upper part of the mandibular ramus. The probe protects the delicate nerves we're trying to find in this region. The temporalis muscle, with its attached coronoid process, can now be easily reflected superiorly. We have now entered the infratemporal fossa. The ramus of the mandible also cracks some during the sawing exposing the inferior alveolar nerve. Let's label the pertinent structures. First we can see the reflected temporalis muscle. Reflecting the muscle allows us to clearly enter the infratemporal fossa. The exposed maxilla is evident, albeit it has not been clean of connective tissue which masks the bone. The two heads of the lateral pterygoid muscle are now exposed, and the medial pterygoid muscle, deep to the lateral pterygoid muscle, can be observed. Finally, the inferior alveolar nerve is labeled, demonstrating that the ramus of the mandible was cut superior to the mandibular fossa. The pterygoid muscles are difficult to appreciate in one's first dissection. Also, during the removal of the ramus of the mandible, the pterygoid muscles are often injured. Consequently, I have added this drawing of the muscles as they are observed from behind the mandible. On the right side of the image, let's label the structures we are familiar with. The body of the mandible, the angle of the mandible, the ramus of the mandible, and the condylar process. The bony maxilla is also evident. Moving now to the left side of the image, we can observe the two heads of the lateral pterygoid and the medial pterygoid muscle. These are muscles of mastication and they can move the lower jaw from side to side as well as help protrude and retract the lower jaw. Moving back to the dissection, the structures we just discussed are labeled, but now I want to point out another major structure found associated with this area, the external carotid artery. The external carotid artery terminates into two relatively large vessels, 
just posterior to the mandible. The superficial temporal artery, observed previously, and the maxillary artery. The latter can run deep to the pterygoid muscles, as in this case, or lateral to the muscles. The next objective of the dissection is to use scissors to remove completely both the lateral and medial pterygoid muscles without injuring any of the important nerves and vessels masked by the two muscles. Let me explain. Here, we're looking at the base of the skull. Let's label a few structures for orientation. The foramen magnum, posteriorly, the palatine process of the maxilla, and the horizontal process of the palatine bone, together forming the hard palate. And just somewhat superior to the hard palate is the sphenoid bone that runs perpendicular to the long axis of the skull. If we now focus on the area of the infratemporal fossa, indicated by the circle, we observe two foramen of interest in this area. The foramen ovale for exit of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve and the foramen spinosum for entry of the middle meningeal artery into the skull. These are the two delicate structures we are trying to preserve and observe when we remove the pterygoid muscles from the infratemporal fossa. If the pterygoid muscles were removed carefully, this is what we should see in the dissection. Here is the maxillary artery, one of the two terminal branches of the external carotid, the other being the superficial temporal artery. We again observe the inferior alveolar nerve, but now we can almost trace it to the foramen ovale. The lingual nerve is clearly visible, and it too can be traced to the foramen ovale. The middle meningeal artery, a branch from the maxillary artery, can be identified. This is because the middle meningeal artery enters the skull via the foramen spinosum in a sandwich by two branches of the auriculotemporal nerve, another branch of the trigeminal, and also carrying parasympathetic fibers from the glossopharyngeal nerve. The two roots of the auriculotemporal nerve then converge into a single root. If we zoom in on the dissection and change the angle of the camera, we can again see the structures we label in the previous slide, and they're indicated in this slide. Again, the middle meningeal artery is present, and so are the two roots of the auriculotemporal nerve. Now focus your attention on the lingual nerve. Note a wispy nerve entering its posterior aspect. This is the corda tympani, a branch of the facial nerve, which provides taste sensation to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. We know the structures we need to demonstrate in the infratemporal fossa are small and difficult to image. Consequently, we present the images now in a different cadaver in which part of the ramus of the mandible was removed and the images colorized to better demonstrate the course of the relevant structures. Let's start labeling these structures. With the temporalis partially reflected, we see the upper and lower heads of the lateral pterygoid muscle, one of the four muscles of mastication, and the medial pterygoid muscle. The two pterygoids, the temporalis and the masseter, make up the four muscles of mastication. The buccinator muscle, also seen in the slide, remember, is a muscle of facial expression. We now observe two nerves, the lingual and the inferior alveolar. The nerves are accompanied by arteries bearing their names. These nerves are branches of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. Cranial nerve 5 is mostly sensory, but it will also carry motor innervation to the muscles of mastication.
these motor fibers are difficult to retain in a dissection because the muscles of mastication must be reflected and or removed to complete this dissection. We can also discern the maxillary artery deep to the ramus of the mandible. The maxillary artery can run lateral to the pterygoid muscles as in this cadaver or deep to the muscles. To examine how the lingual and inferior alveolar nerves enter the infratemporal fossa requires that the lateral pterygoid muscle be removed piecemeal and that was done for this dissection. Careful dissection of the proximal lingual and inferior alveolar nerves will take you to the area of the foramen ovale where V3 exits the skull. After removal of the brain, you will be able to demonstrate how easily a probe can be pushed through this foramen to enter the infratemporal fossa. And now, if we zoom in at much higher magnification than in the previous slide, we can identify the following. Joining the lingual nerve will be the corda tympani, a branch from the facial nerve that is responsible for taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and delivers parasympathetic innervation to the submandibular ganglion. The corda tympani traverses across the inner aspect of the tympanic membrane of the middle ear. This is why middle ear congestion can alter taste and smell. Leaving the inferior of yellow nerve is the nerve to the malohyoid. This is a motor nerve. The other motor branches of V3 were likely torn when the masseter, temporalis, and pterygoids were reflected. The relatively large branch indicated now is the buccal nerve, also a sensory branch to the cheeks. Let's now focus on a difficult nerve to see, but nonetheless important to understand, the auriculotemporal nerve. Also note the otic ganglion. The otic ganglion will send postganglionic fibers to join the auriculotemporal nerve, and these will travel to the parotid gland to stimulate release of saliva. As you can see also, the auriculotemporal nerve exhibits a split, and through this split, the middle meningeal artery will traverse and enter the cranium via the foramen spinosum. Having discussed the nerves, let's say a few words about the arteries in this region. To recap, the external carotid artery terminally divides to become the maxillary and the superficial temporal arteries. The maxillary artery will give rise to numerous branches in the infratemporal fossa. You really do not need to know their names, except recognize that the important middle meningeal artery thus arise from the maxillary artery. Within the skull, this artery travels along the inner aspect of the thin, flat area of the temporal bone and as such is susceptible to rupture when a person is struck hard in this region, which is called the pterion. This results in blood accumulating between the dora and the inner aspect of the skull, producing an extradural hematoma. If the pressure caused by this hematoma on the brain is not relieved, the patient will die. Ultimately, the maxillary artery travels to the sphenopalatine foramen and enters the nasal cavity from behind to become the sphenopalatine artery. In this last dissection, the lateral wall of the mandibular ramus has been removed to show how the infraorbital nerve traverses the mandibular canal to supply sensation to the lower teeth and then exits the canal via the mental foramen to supply general sensation to the lower part of the face by way of the mental nerve. If you have ever had dental anesthesia, now you can understand why your chin also went numb on the anesthetized side. This now concludes the dissection of the infratemporal fossa.